Hey everyone, it's John from Marco Learning. If you're taking AP English Literature, you're in the right place. I'm with Heather Garcia. How are you doing tonight, Heather? Doing well, and yourself? I'm amazing. I'm happy to be here with so many wonderful teachers and students. It's Teacher Appreciation Week this week, so go ahead and put your teacher's name in the chat, and we'll give them some shout outs through our session today. And also post the questions that you have, because we want to make sure that we are um, helping you all as much as we can. The exam is, when is this exam, Heather? Is it like three weeks from now or like tomorrow? Tomorrow. Um, so you're not, we're not going to change our AP English literature score in just a few minutes. By the way, everyone, I'm, this is, um, sunny Philadelphia behind me. Um, and Heather, where are you joining from today? Southwest Florida, not quite as sunny right now. Massive thunderstorms. Yes, I was always terrible. I know one thing about Florida is I can't rely on any sunshine. So let us know in the chat where everyone's coming from. And we see uh, Mrs. Shout out to Nas. Shout out to Mrs. Gnocchi. Um, Mrs. Paupko. Um, so great. So anyway, Heather, I'm going to turn it over to you. What, what should we look forward to in this session today? What are we going to cover as we go through this content? We are focusing quite heavily on question three in the open response where you guys get to take the novels that you've worked so hard on this year and really get those ready to prepare for the test tomorrow. Because honestly, if, as far as studying goes, that's the one thing that you have such hard you know, control over. Yeah, exactly. It is that it's the one question you don't get any like thing to work with and people feel paralyzed. So we're so glad you're here to help us. Everyone, I'm going to join Heather in the chat. Post your questions there. If you like this video, press that like button and uh, best of luck on your exam tomorrow. All right. I am so happy that you guys are here. I am going to share my screen. I'm going to start my slideshow. All right, guys, it is the night before your AP literature test. So first of all, I'm going to remind you that it is going to be so important that you get just a really good night's sleep tonight. So we have this event and then Tim Freitas has an event right after this, and then you have to go to bed. Those are your rules. So let's look over quickly our agenda. We're gonna do a quick overview of rubrics for the AP literature exam because you have to know what the rules are in order to play the game well. And then we're gonna work on breaking down the prompts, annotating for the prompts, answering the prompts, and then just some overall last minute testing tips that'll apply to the whole test. So what is on the test? We're gonna pretend like you had a momentary panic, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what's on this test. So just to ease that, just know that when you walk in tomorrow, you're gonna to have your multiple choice section first, 45% of your total score, it'll take an hour for that multiple choice section. There'll be about 55 questions and about five passages. So that means you'll have about a minute to answer or to read each passage and then a minute to answer each question. It won't always shake out exactly that way. Sometimes your, you know, one question might take 30 seconds, one question might take two minutes, a passage you may have to read twice. It's not an exact science, but it does shake out that way that it's about a minute to read each passage and about a minute per question. Then you'll have a nice little break, right? Like little, you should bring a snack, just something little, get a drink of water, stand up, eat something, and then dive into the next part, which is where we're really gonna spend a lot of our time today, which is your free response questions. 55% of your total score on this AP exam is coming from your free response questions. You will have two hours, to complete three essays. And in the script that the proctors have to read, they're supposed to tell you when 40 minutes has passed each time the 40 minutes has passed. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. We can't control that. So it's just something to keep in mind as you're watching the clock. Let's start by looking at the rubrics. When we're looking at the rubrics, right? This is so it's a nice thing about AP Lit is that for all three essays, the rubric is really similar. So you'll always have row A, row B, and row C. Row A will always be about the thesis point. Row B will always be about commentary and evidence. And row C is always sophistication. We're going to take these one row at a time. We are looking at specifically the rubric for question three. If it was the one for poetry, it would just say poem instead of text. Like it's very, very similar. So let's look at the thesis point and how you earn that because AP traditionally 
has given out the thesis point rather generously. And we just want to make sure that you're not missing out on this opportunity to earn the thesis point. So you need to provide a defensible interpretation of the selected work. That means you're doing more than just summarizing what's in the story or in the novel or in the play or in the poem. You are giving me something that I can argue against because you're going to have to spend the rest of your essay proving it. And it's going to have to respond to the prompt. And that means you have to respond to the entire prompt, not just a part of the prompt. So if the prompt is asking you for two things or three things, well, you better give me both or all three of those things in the thesis. The thesis should probably happen and occur in the opening paragraph. It might not show up until the closing, especially if you have a rocky start, right? Sometimes you read a poem or you read an excerpt and you're just like, oh my goodness, I cannot even imagine how I'm going to write an essay about this, but I'm going to try. And then you start writing and you realize about halfway through, you're like, oh, that's what this poem's about. And then your essay gets going good. You're writing yourself into a higher score because you're thinking about it. If that happens, your thesis may not show up really well until the closing. That's fine. Don't panic. We will find your thesis statement and award you the points, even if it's in the closing. So I do have a couple of sample paragraphs in here from you for you that came from the 2021 test from College Board. And so I want to go over this prompt so that we can um, go over those samples. Sorry, I need a drink. All right. Let's look at this prompt from 2021. This is question three, open response. In many works of fiction, houses take on symbolic importance. Such houses may be literal houses or unconventional ones, like hotels or hospitals or monasteries or boats. Either from your own reading or from the list below, choose a work of fiction in which a literal or unconventional house serves as a significant symbol. Then, in a well-written essay, analyze how this house contributes to an interpretation of the work as a whole. Do not merely summarize the plot. College Board does not want you to summarize the plot. AP readers do not want you to summarize the plot. Even on question three, where students, I think, are more tempted to summarize the plot because they're so worried that the reader won't understand the book that they read or won't have read the book. They feel like they really need to set the scene. Don't do that. You can just place us in a moment within the text and that will work. So let's look at this first sample. I'm going to read it out loud because I know that the handwriting can get a little wonky, especially if you're watching on a smaller device. So in House of Leaves by Mark, I don't know, Dolinsky, the novel mostly details the story or documentary of a man and his family whose house is larger on the inside than it is on the outside. The house signifies a certain overwhelming horror as various characters venture deeper and deeper into the ever-expanding house. The house is almost like a cave system for the characters to explore and highlights all of the insignificant parts of life. The house makes the characters question their morals and overall place in the world. So with this sample of an introduction, it is for sure getting the thesis point because it's telling us that the house signifies a certain overwhelming horror. Well, okay, that's symbolism. And then in that last line, the house makes the characters question all their morals and overall place in the world. Well, that's the meaning of the work as a whole. So this one earns the thesis point for sure, which is great. Here is another example from the same 2021 test from College Board. So in the novel, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, Huck's house is nature. Houses often provide a sense of comfort and security. As Huck and Jim are traveling up and down the Mississippi River, the only house that remains constant for Huck is nature. This one doesn't really tell me what the house in this particular example symbolizes. They're talking about houses in general. Okay, maybe, maybe we can make that stretch. But what they're not doing is giving us how the house contributes to the meaning of the work as a whole. And I would really need to see that in order to confidently award this thesis statement points. So my lesson to you on the night before the test is that when you're writing your thesis statements, be certain that you are explicit with what you're trying to say. Look at the prompt. Number what you need to write down, like list it out in your prompt. And then make certain that your thesis statement hits every part of that prompt. And I'm going to show you some example, examples of what that looks like in just a minute. So let's look at evidence and commentary. 
When you're looking at row B, this is where most of your points are hopefully earned in your AP test for each of the three essays. When we look at your essay, we're able to, I don't wanna say quickly, but usually fairly confidently determine whether your essay is going to live in the upper half of row B or the lower half of row B based on how much evidence you give and how many body paragraphs you have and how big they are. Because if you are only giving us some evidence and only some of it's tied to the argument and only some of it is explained, your body paragraphs are going to be kind of small. And so the more evidence you give and the more commentary you give, the longer they're going to be and the better the likelihood that we're going to get you into that three or four point range. We want to be in that three or four point range. So let's look at what it takes to get a three. Okay. To get a three you have to have sufficient and relevant evidence, okay? It needs to offer, um, support your argument in a way that is going to really enhance. And look at that third bullet point, multiple claims are included. That is important because if you don't have multiple claims, notice in the one point and the two point, it doesn't say that. That means you can't earn a three in the body paragraph. So if all you say to me is, let's go back to this example, that the house in the adventures of Huckleberry Finn provides a sense of comfort and security. And then you spend the rest of your essay defending that sense of comfort and security by giving me six examples of comfort and security. And that's all you do. You don't have multiple claims to get me to that three points. You're going to be living in a one or a two, even if every example you give me is so well done and with beautiful evidence and great commentary, you only have one claim and I can't award you a three or a four because you don't have multiple. So when you are diving into your essays tomorrow, keep in mind that you need to have multiple points to talk about right? So maybe you have an entire paragraph dedicated to explaining what the house symbolizes and giving me some examples, and then another whole paragraph explaining to me how it contributes to the meaning of the work as a whole and some examples, right? Because then you have two separate claims for sure, and we can lean you more towards that three and four point range. To earn the four points, your evidence needs to be specific and relevant, and every claim you make needs to have support, and it should be well-reasoned and well-organized with super clear explanations, and that is a really important distinction, and then look at that four, or yeah, the fourth bullet point under commentary for four points. It explains the writer's literary techniques with multiple examples that are tied to interpretation, right? You're not just dropping in like, hey, here's a simile. Hey, I found a metaphor. It's not a scavenger hunt. But if you happen to notice that this book is a metaphor for some larger bit of life, well, then by all means, please mention it, right? Because if you can connect it to an interpretation of the work, then you're working your way towards evidence and commentary and earning that four, which is what we want. So let's look at the continuation of this essay from House of Leaves, right? We looked at that first intro. Remember, it earned the thesis point. So now let's look at the body paragraphs. House of Leaves is truly about a man who finds the writings of his late neighbor, which entails the story of a once famous film director and his family who move into a house which is bigger inside than out. Okay, plot summary. In some ways, the house is almost human in its ever-changing complexities maybe a claim. It originally starts when the director is renovating the house and realizing that it's bigger inside by some three quarters of an inch. Throughout the novel, the house creates a door which further leads to the cavernous hallways and a labyrinth, which is the house. Plot summary. Let's look at the next one. The house serves as a sort of madness for the characters. A little bit of symbolism. Only not only for the director, but also for the neighbor who documents the story, but also for the main character who struggles with his mental illness and confusion and relationship with his mother. I'm going to pause here because, yes, we definitely got some symbolism mentioned, but now we are just flying through each of these specific examples without any elaboration. That's a problem. He later in the novel travels all throughout the U.S. trying to find the house. The house, whether actually real or fake, drives characters mad. The director becomes obsessed with exploring it and buying headlamps and high-tech cameras and satisfying the purpose of documenting the house. Okay. 
these body paragraphs are falling short. Let's look at the evidence in the commentary, okay? Look at the two points. Is there some specific evidence? Yeah. Is it relevant? Yep. Is it tied to the argument? Is it mixing specific evidence with broad generalizations? Yes. Is it lacking a line of reasoning or progression of ideas? A little bit. I feel like we're just like dancing around the same topic over and over again, which is that the house makes people crazy. Simplistic, repetitive, or inaccurate explanations. Yeah. These body paragraphs are landing this essay in a two-point realm for me. So yes, they earned the thesis point, which was super, but now they've only earned two out of four points. What they could have done differently is really dove into specific moments and how those moments propelled the madness and why that madness ties into the meaning of the work as a whole, right? Those connections could have been made a little bit more clearly and elaborated upon. All right, I'm just checking the chat. Okay. Um, Yep, I missed a couple of questions. So I'm gonna pause right here and answer them. All right, tips for interpreting old texts for the multiple choice section. Okay, guys, when you have older texts for the multiple choice sections or even for the prose, I wanna tell you to take your time a little bit, but what I think is gonna be more important is that you start by looking at the prompt if it's the essay or looking at the actual question stems if it's multiple choice, because those older texts can be a little bit dense. And sometimes I know I get caught up in the syntax, right? I'm so caught up in trying to figure out what it's saying that it's hard to get that larger meaning. And sometimes the questions themselves in multiple choice will clue you in on what's happening in the story, particularly the very last question in that multiple choice set. So if you have a poem that's older, go right to that last question because that last question about that poem is going to be an overall question. So like overall, when you're reading this poem, are you getting a sense of, and you're going to see what those options are. Now, at least you've narrowed it down to a couple of options, right? And then looking at the sentence stems for the rest of them can kind of clue you in. So if I'm seeing a lot of questions about death and morbidity and I read it and I'm like, oh dang, I totally thought this was about like life and happiness. Well, I did it wrong. Okay, let's go back and reassess. <laughs> and then um, one of the other questions I'm seeing is more than one person has asked, how do you write a good conclusion without restating the thesis? Well, here's the deal, kids. You don't need a concluding paragraph. It's nowhere in the rubric. It doesn't exist. College board is expecting you to do a solid introduction with a thesis statement. It's asking you to do some really great body paragraph work, but it doesn't say you need a closing paragraph. So my suggestion is that your final body paragraph, you tack on a couple of sentences at the end of it where you're talking about the significance of the work as a whole. And in doing so, you're going to, if you're talking about theme, you will most likely be bringing it back to the thesis to the prompt without beating it over their head. Because conclusions traditionally in essays are for longer works. You've read a 25 page medical journal article and you get to the end and you're like, oh my goodness, what did I just read? And they're like, here, we'll wrap it up for you. This is what you just read. And then you're like, oh, thank you. But this is a three or four page draft. This is not a polished piece of writing that has huge, um, implications as far as like medical terminology like that isn't this this is an opportunity for you to explore a text and prove to the readers that you can read at a collegiate level and write at a collegiate level and interpret literature and a concluding statement doesn't a concluding statement should be there but a concluding paragraph doesn't need to be I hope I answered the question Another question I'm seeing. So is a thesis our overarching argument and the body paragraphs are the multiple claims? Yes, as long as your body paragraphs are doing more than just providing lots of evidence for the one point in the body, I'm sorry, in the introduction, then yes, that's exactly what it's doing. Your thesis is the overarching argument and then your body paragraphs are the multiple claims. Um, Graham is asking, how do we define the complexity of a character? Okay. When you're talking about character complexity, you wanna talk about the pieces of life that make us real. So I am incredibly 
I don't know, introspective, right? Like I do a lot of self-reflection and a lot of, um, you know, just like working on making sure that I'm the best version of myself that I can be, but I'm also incredibly impulsive. And I have that problem where sometimes the things come out of my mouth and I'm just forever speaking in draft. And I wish I had a delete button and I could fix it, but I can't because, my, you know, once it out, it's out. So then I spend all of my time after a conversation replaying it and thinking of all the things I wish I'd done differently because I'm introspective, right? So that complexity is battling against itself, right? So when you're looking at a character, you're looking for those pieces that come back one another that still exist at the same time, but that don't always mesh, <laughs> right? It's that juxtaposition that you're looking for. Um, And that's the best way I can describe it is looking for those opposing characteristics inside a character. Okay. Um, A good example of character complexity is with a Romeo and Romeo and Juliet. I figure that's a good general example. So the very, very beginning of the play, right? Romeo is so incredibly in love with Rosaline and like wanting nothing but her, but he's very upset because she will not um, give him what it is that he wants in that moment. So then he turns all of his attention to Juliet and is now completely in love with her. So that juxtaposition of balancing like what true love is with like teenage lust and then trying to combine it all together creates complexity, right? Because he is a multifaceted character who makes really horrible choices, by the way, bad life choices in that way. Okay, so let's talk about sophistication because I just got done telling you that a concluding statement, a concluding paragraph is not 100% necessary in order to achieve a passing score on this test. However, I'm about to contradict myself because if you want that sophistication point, okay, I think that a solid concluding paragraph can help you get there. It's not a guarantee that you're going to get there, but it can help. Only 18% of the students earned the sophistication point in 2021. I don't think it's something that you need to get yourself totally hung up on, especially the night before the test. At this point, the night before the test, we're just looking to get as much as we can in that evidence and elaboration. But some places where you might be able to impress your reader. Let's look at what it takes to earn a point. Demonstrates sophisticated thinking. Well, you know what? You're not going to become a more sophisticated thinker tonight. So maybe we move on to the next one, developing a complex literary argument. Well, if you're already talking about things that are juxtaposed, that are against one another, then you're already talking about complexity and your literary argument is going to reflect as such. Same with the third one, exploring complexities and tensions in the selected work. You're already there. Places interpretation into a larger context. This bullet right here is the reason I'm focusing on question three tonight, because here's the deal. When you approach the multiple choice, you probably won't have context, right? They're going to be pulling poems from all over the place and passages from all over the place. We're not going to know where those come from. That's fine. When you dive into the essays and you are given the poem and you're given the prose, you might recognize where they come from. Chances are you won't. College Board does a really good job of finding the most obscure pieces of text to work with because they want to make sure everybody has a fair shot. But that means that you won't really be able to put that text into a larger context unless you just get lucky and you happen to end up with a text where you're like, oh my gosh, I know who this is from. I read this book. Then you can place it in a larger context. When you're fine. But question three, the literary argument, that is our goal. We know the books that we've read this year. We know the time periods they were written in. We know the authors. We know how it fits into that broader realm of like social movements. And that means that when we write our introductions and our closings, we can talk about the context that this work was written in and how it affected readers and how it affected movements if it did and how it reflected the thinking of the time. And that my friends is sophisticated thinking. And when you can articulate it on paper and connect it to the prompt, you're showing the AP readers that you didn't just read this book. You internalized this book. You have made it a part of your persona. And now you can move forward and you can use it in the essay. And that's a really great thing. Employs a vivid and persuasive writing style. We cannot affect that tonight. 
but engaging in multiple interpretations of the passage, yeah, you can absolutely say some people see the monster in Frankenstein is this. However, the more popular interpretation of this, this, and this is the one that fits best with this argument, right? Like you can entertain those things because you've read these books and you've talked about these books. Okay, doing a quick time check. All right, so let's look at how we break down the prompts because when you sit down to take all three of these essay prompts, you're going to want to make sure that you approach them in a way that allows you to answer them fully. So based on the 2021 prompt that we've already looked at, let's look at the prompt again. In many works of fiction, houses take on symbolic importance. Such houses may be literal houses or unconventional ones, either from your reading or from the list below. Choose a work of fiction in which a literal or unconventional house serves a significant symbol. Then in a well-written essay, analyze how this house contributes to interpretation of the work as a whole. Do not merely summarize the plot. Look at these four things I have written out on the side. This is what we need to make sure we do in our essay. Which house is going to serve as a symbol? You've got to pick a house out of all the things you've read. Now, remember, it could be a hospital or a hotel or a monastery or a book. What does it symbolize, right? So it says we need to choose a house that serves as a symbol. But if you don't explicitly tell me what it symbolizes and you just dance around it the whole time, you're missing the mark. What is significant about this symbolization? Why does it matter that they made this a symbol? Explain it to me. Be explicit. You need to spell it out for the readers. We cannot jump into your brain and you cannot assume that we are following you on your train of thought. You need to give us very explicit examples and explanations about what it is that you're talking about and how you're connecting it back to your thesis. Don't just assume that we're going to follow you there because we're not. You've got to write it out. What is the interpretation of the work as a whole? This is how, the like fourth question, that's how I like to end my essays. Because if I make the interpretation of the work as a whole, my final body paragraph, no matter what I did at the openings, that gets me closer to ending on like the whole work and kind of reflecting on it. And it feels like a conclusion. And I can just tack a sentence on at the end, talking about connecting it back to the prompt, and I'm good. So that's how I end my essays, is talking about the interpretation of the work as a whole and really narrowing down on that. It works for me. So let's look. This is a prompt that you may not have, you probably have not seen before because I made it. So let's look at this prompt and look at the questions that we were able to pull from it. I mirrored this after the um, template the College Board uses when they create their prompts. So pride is a powerful attitude that can bolster a person's self-worth and can also topple nations. It's explored often in literature because the effects of pride can be varying and can influence the trajectory of a character or an entire plot. From your own reading, choose a work of fiction in which pride is addressed. Then in a well-written essay, analyze how pride contributes to an interpretation of the work as a whole. Do not merely summarize the plot. Okay, so as we're looking at this, what story are you going to pick that explores pride? Because there's tons. Which character is going to be the focus? Because you probably should just focus on one. How does that pride affect him or her? How does that pride affect his or her relationships? And how does it affect the meaning of the work as a whole? Did the prompt ask me explicitly for all of those things? No. Here's how I'm pulling those apart. I'm looking for the complexity. So it's telling me to analyze how pride, well, to choose a work of fiction with such dress and then to analyze how pride contributes to the work as a whole. Well, first I have to talk about the character. I have to define what that pride is and how it affects him. And then it's just whenever I'm thinking about how pride affects a character, I am always going to follow that up with how does it affect his or her relationships? Because a character doesn't live in a vacuum unless it's a really bizarre text. Um, there's always some sort of outside force. And so I always want to place that person in the realm of the outside to try to get some complexity in there. That's why it's there. So let's look at how I would address this. The prompt is the same. We're not going to look at it again. I just put it up there in case you needed a visual reference. But in red, 
you'll see how I would have responded roughly, of course, to this prompt. So what story am I working with? Withering Heights, what character? Heathcliff. How does that pride affect him? Well, it creates a real bitterness in him and he feels like he constantly has to prove his own worth because of that bitterness. Like he, it's like a false bravado kind of. How does that pride affect his or her relationships? Well, Heathcliff pushes away anyone who might've been good for him because he's constantly guarded and feeling like he has to prove himself. And so that pride is his downfall. And that creates this as really a cautionary tale, which I can then connect to the work as a whole. All right, I'm gonna check in with the questions before I move on to another one real quick. All right, can you give examples of sophistication points in an essay? Um, so I love that question, but I did not pull any samples of that. What I can tell you is, is if you go to College Board's website, they always release um, high scoring essays and middle scoring essays and low scoring essays. But when you open up the sample essays on their past tests, you'll see that the first essay that they always list is the one that scored the highest. And just look at some of those samples and see how students did well. Now, before 2020, you're not going to see the same rubric. It was on a nine point scale then. But if an essay scored an eight or a nine on the old rubric, it most likely earns sophistication points on the new one. Not a guarantee, but it's a most likely. Um, Jonathan asks, what are some must know literary devices and elements? Okay, I'm going to say that focusing on selection of detail is always a solid choice because it is a, an element of literature, right? When you're selecting those really spectacular details that are going to emphasize whatever point you're trying to make, that is a solid win. If you're looking at poem or the poem or the prose text, word choice, right? That um, specific and calculated use of diction in order to like evoke certain tones. Those are great ones to pull out. I am not wasting my time writing an essay about similes and metaphors and personification, because unless those things are contributing to the meaning of the work as a whole, it's just fillers. College Board does not require you to label any fancy devices like an Afra or it's just they don't care, hypophora. That's not what this test is about. It's knowing that you can look deeply at the text and pick apart some things. So yeah, selection of detail, diction leading to tone. Um, those are some like solid hits. And characterization. Characterization is a literary element. And that for sure is one that I would focus on. Is a novel required for the third FRQ or can we use a novella or an epic? Okay, so yes to all of it. You can use a novel, you can use a play, you can use an epic. I caution against novellas um, unless they're particularly rich because sometimes when they are so short, it can be difficult to pull multiple examples for the points that you're trying to make. But I mean, you can. What I don't recommend, because I'm thinking about epic and then of course I'm going Harry Potter, right? You don't want to do anything that's in a series because if there's a book in a series like Lord of the Rings, the character development happens over a course of multiple books. And that is not what College Board is looking for at all. They want one text. Are the books listed specifically because they line up with the prompt somewhat? A hundred percent. I'm going to minimize this chat. And I'm going to go back to, I think I'm going to go back. Yep, right there. Okay. When you get to question three, here's my suggestion. When you start reading the prompt, I want you to put your hand over and cover all of those options. All 40 of those books, just cover them up. Read the prompt. Think of two books that you could use to write about it write plays, whatever it is that you're going to work with. Think about those, right, get them locked in your head, and then look at the list. Because here's what can happen when you look at that list. You look at that list and you think, okay, I've only read one. And you panic and you're like, oh, or you look at it, you're the list and you're like, I've never read a book in my life. I don't know any of these titles, right? It can cause you to panic. Like I can look at this list and I'm like already thinking like, oh my gosh, there's so many of these I haven't read. That's not the point. The point of this list is that if you panic and you're like, I've never read a book, I have no idea what to write about for here. You can look at this list and you can be like, oh, to kill a mockingbird. Of course, I can do this. Are you limited to this list? Absolutely not. Will every title on this list somehow help you with this prompt? 
hundred percent, but you can't write about North Hanger Abbey if you haven't read it. And you don't want that lost opportunity to be what you're thinking about when you should be thinking about which book you want to use. So like I said, cover the list, pick your books, and then look at the list to see if maybe they have one that's, um, I don't know, a little more razzle dazzly that you had considered. But for the most part, that is the purpose of the list and it will help you if you're stuck. All right, let me go back to the questions. All right, do we need a hook in the introduction and can we just jump into the thesis? By all means, please jump right into that thesis. We are not interested in your broad platitudes about how everybody in life just needs second chances. We don't need it. Jump right into your thesis, you're good. Bri asks, is it a good idea to memorize a sample prompt essay word by word to get a feel of how a good essay should sound? No, that will not help you at all. Um, if you are spending all of your time memorizing, I would much rather you be spending that time going back into one of your favorite books and just refreshing yourself on some of the key scenes. Just open up to random pages and reread just to refresh yourself. That is a way better use of your time. How do we connect our claims together? And do we need to connect each claim to a line of reasoning? Your claims are going to all stem from your thesis. So your thesis will lead to each of your claims and that creates a line of reasoning. Every time you connect an idea back to your thesis and you remind readers like, hey, this supports this idea, you are just solidifying that line of reasoning. And your claims, should build on one another, but they don't need to be connected necessarily, right? Like you don't have to be like, and now we're going to elaborate on this idea. And like, you don't need to make it so clinical, right? Are we allowed to use a children's book as literature to write about? I am going to give you two answers for this because I think it depends on how you define a children's book. So look at this list for question three, second row about halfway down the secret garden. That is a children's book. So if I were to say, no, absolutely not. Uh, clearly college board's like, hey, secret garden, we're all in, do it. It's made for children. So clearly it's acceptable. Would I recommend using a picture book? Absolutely not, not a chance because there is just not going to be enough in there for you to write about, to pull specific examples. It's just not gonna be rich enough. And don't get me wrong, I am a huge fan of children's books. Like I love picture books and I think that there's a lot of richness and depth to them, but I would not use them for this essay. But, right, Secret Garden, 350-ish page children book, how about it? Okay, Sylvia asks, if we misinterpret a poem incorrectly in the poetry essay, will we automatically get a lower score if we interpreted it correctly? I'm not gonna say automatically. Um, there are multiple interpretations that can be considered correct. And there is no one single interpretation that we are looking for as readers. However, if you are just wildly off the mark, it, I mean, you would have to be wildly off the mark. It may decrease your score a little bit because it's going to be really hard to get to that four range if what you're doing is just so, so wildly deviant. But Honestly, I haven't seen a misinterpretation get in the way like that as a reader. Like, I just, I haven't seen it. Others may have, but I haven't. For the most part, I can roll with most of the interpretations. Like, if you're backing it up and you're proving it, I'm like, oh, look at you go, convincing me something else, right? The whole point of this, right, taking the test, having the readers, is to celebrate the work that you have done. When readers come in, we are not looking at an essay that started at a six and we're not taking points away. We're looking to actively award you points. So we, everybody starts at a zero before we start reading. And then I'm like, oh yes, I get to give you a point for thesis. Fantastic. Let me give you a couple points for the body paragraph. Ooh, this body paragraph got better. Let me give you another point. Let's knock it up to a three, right? We're not looking to take the points away just because you interpreted wrong. I hope that helps. All right, so now I'm gonna look at the second sample here. Keep an eye on my time. I wanna make sure that we get done right in time for you guys to go to um, Tim Friedis's uh, review because I think that's going to be spectacular. Okay, 
Individuals, families, and collective cultures create and embrace traditions that serve to connect people and remind people where they've come from, right? This is the introduction to question three. So we're talking about traditions. In novels, some characters propel these traditions and others move away from them. So from your own reading, choose a work of fiction in which traditions are addressed. Then in a well-written essay, analyze how these traditions contribute to an inter interpretation of the work as a whole. Don't merely summarize the plot. Look at the questions I have at the bottom. And again, I'm trying to kind of decompress this prompt and give myself stuff to write about. So here's the questions that I'm coming up with as I'm looking at this prompt. I'm thinking, okay, which story is going to explore traditions the most? Okay. And remember, in the prompt, it could be that they're celebrating the traditions or moving away from them. What are those traditions, right? I have to be able to define what they are. Why are they important? Are they important just to this group of people? Are they important to society? Like, why are these important traditions important enough to bring up in a book? And then who are they important to? They're not going to be important to everybody. Otherwise, they're not going to be in the book. There's no conflict there. And then how does the significance of these contribute traditions contribute to the meaning of the work as a whole? So let's look at, again, this is just the same exact prompt. I just put it here in case you need like a placeholder. Um, I'm looking at the five questions and now I'm going to kind of walk you through what my responses would be. So for this one, I was thinking that using their eyes or watching God by Zoranya Hurston would be a great one because the main character, Janie, is just super rebellious and is just bucking tradition all over the place. So what are those traditions? Well, it's that traditional role of women in society. And I can spend a full paragraph defining what those roles were and why they didn't work for her. So why are these roles important? Well, if they're gonna establish and maintain that part patriarchal nature of society at the time. And who are they important to? Well, society as a whole, but particularly the people in Janie's town, because they ended up looking down on her pretty intensely for not following. Uh, the prescribed roles that the traditional patriarchy set up for her. And then her refusal to conform to these norms really contribute to her growth as a woman and her quest to find happiness and fulfillment, which establishes the idea that like you don't have to have all of those traditions in place in order to find happiness, right? So I'm trying to connect it to that meaning of the work as a whole. All right, I'm going to check in. I see that there's a new chat. Okay. Um, my teacher's been advising me not to include literary devices into the thesis. So I just jumped right into my significant observation. Yes, bypass those literary devices because here's the temptation. Um, if you are listing literary devices in your thesis statement, your temptation might be to write a paragraph about personification. And then to write a paragraph where you're giving a bunch of examples about similes and another paragraph where you're giving a bunch of examples about tone. And that does not make for a super dynamic essay, which is why I organize my essays by answering these questions. So I think of some questions based on the prompt and this is my outline, right? So like numbers, number one and probably number two would show up in my introductory paragraph. Number three, is going to be its own body paragraph. Four is its own body paragraph. Five is its own body paragraph and the closing, right? So I'm framing my essay based on ideas that are connected to the theme rather than devices. And that just makes for a richer essay. For the prose essay, this is another question. Is it better to cite by using quotations or just referencing lines? I prefer I mean, I guess you could have a mixture, but my preference is when you pull maybe three or four words, like a phrase, and you use those to cite your work. So you're talking about how the character says, and you put those three or four words in, and then why that is significant. You don't need to cite a line number. You don't need to quote more than seven words in a, you know, a space because the more you're actually quoting, the less you're taking away from your own interpretation. So just throw a couple words in there to place us where we're supposed to be in the essay or the poem, and then pull back out and really focus on the analysis. Because I promise you that the readers have read either the prose piece or the poem piece so many times that when you put just those couple words, we can visualize where it is in the passage without even going back and looking because we've read it so many times. So. All right, so I'm going to minimize the chat just for now, and I'm going to keep going. 
Okay, checking my time. So talking about answering the prompts for the essays. We have an AP literature study guide pack that is on the Marco Learning website that is 100% free. It is 28 pages of awesome advice. I highly suggest that you spend some time looking through it tonight, not staying up late, but looking through it tonight, looking through it in the morning, just refreshing yourself because there's some gold in there. But one of the things that you will notice towards the back of that study guide is that we have approaches to these essays and each essay has its own study guide. But to be honest, they all kind of follow a very similar process. So when you sit down to do each of these three essays, here's kind of how you should pace yourself. Maybe take just two minutes to read the prompt and come up with those questions. Read the passage if there's a passage in there, right? If there's an actual passage, read the passage. If it's just the literary argument, take a moment, right? To think about which books you're gonna use. Then you're gonna write your thesis statement on, your, on the prompt itself as a draft because that thesis statement is gonna be the driving force of your whole essay and you really wanna get it right. So just on your prompt, spend a few minutes really making sure that that thesis is top notch. First of all, you wanna earn the point, but second of all, you wanna make sure it's driving your essay. And then you're gonna plan the essay out super fast, so quickly. If you do a system like I do, where you're just articulating questions based on the prompt, that is my pre-writing. And it takes me about three minutes to do. It doesn't take me long. So you could use it for there, or you can use the plan that's recommended here where you map out what do you want your two really great body paragraphs to be about? What specific evidence do you think you might mention and reference? And then you're gonna write. You're gonna spend the last 30 minutes writing your actual essay. Then you'll get to the new prompt and then you'll start again. Do it three times. Okay, I see a new question that came in. I don't want to miss it. Okay, Louisa is asking, how do you use the topic to interpret the work as a whole? Can you give us some tips about that? Okay, so when you're thinking about the work as a whole, what they're basically asking you is theme. So when they're asking you to connect the symbol of a house with a theme, okay, if the symbol of the house is constraint and the character just wants to be free, then I will assume that when the character is able to free themselves of that house, that they're going to find freedom, right? You're wanting to make sure that you are connecting the prompt piece to whatever the theme is, and then you're going to hit the interpretation of the work as a whole, for sure. Just talk about theme. And then what should be the outline for the essay? Can we use the rhetorical device in your thesis? If you've been practicing using literary devices in your thesis statements and that's your comfort level, then please do that. Don't try to switch your whole way of writing essays tonight. Um, but you're gonna wanna make sure that if that isn't something you've been doing, that you, that you try to maybe avoid that a little bit. In your outline, I would just do a couple of body paragraphs that have claims that support your um, thesis statement. Okay, so I'm going to minimize the chat and now I'm going to keep cruising because I want to make sure that I am cognizant of the time. I want to be courteous. So last part, ready? Last minute tips. Remember I told you that there's this study guide pack that's on the AP website, I'm sorry, on the um, Marco Learning free resources page, right? We have in there a particular study guide that is test day tips. It gives you suggestions for the night before, for test day, a plan of action. So I took these pages and then I just kind of narrowed them down, right? So we're just focusing on these little chunks. So tonight, please make sure that you get adequate sleep. You want to be well rested. You don't want to be rushed in the morning. So you're gonna wanna really make sure that you pace out your morning appropriately, work backwards. If you know that you've got to be at your test at eight, you should probably plan on getting there at 7.30, figure out what time you need to leave the house, make sure you give yourself time for breakfast, right? All those things. And then don't get too distracted by your phone. Right? <laughs> let's, let's put that aside. 
And then tomorrow morning, try to stick to your normal routine as possible. If you don't usually eat bacon and eggs and pancakes for breakfast, please don't try it tomorrow. You don't want a tummy ache and don't overdo the coffee tomorrow because my goodness, you want to be focused, but you don't want your hand to be shaken. Um, dress comfortably, but not in pajamas because that'll make you sleepy and make sure that you have layers, right? Because what if the room is cold? What if the room is hot, right? You want to make sure that that works. Bring snacks. Because right in between that multiple choice and that essay, you will have time for a snack and you want to make sure that you can fuel your brain and your body. Make sure that when you dive into the multiple choice, you are really timing yourself and figure out what that halfway mark is. And when you hit 30 minutes, hopefully you're about halfway through. You've got, you know, 25 questions behind you um, or 27 or whatever. And then the free response questions, maybe you start off with the one that's your strength. If you want to dive right into the literary argument essay, you can. You don't have to go in the order that they prescribe. You can go in the order of your strengths. And then make sure that for the literary argument essay, you've got about three books in mind that you know that you could pull on to write about. Multiple choice reminders, again, manage your time for skim the first few questions before you tackle that reading and don't allow yourself to get stuck. If you end up spending six minutes on a question, you can't get those, those minutes back and all of the questions are worth the exact same number of points. So you're not going to get bonus points just because you answered that one question that took you six minutes right and you ended up with getting four that you didn't get to do, right? You wanna make sure that you are pacing yourself well. All right. So I'm gonna address just these last few questions. Um, yep, John wants to pop in and let's let him join us. Um, Archie asks, what do you do if you don't recognize a word on the multiple choice? You just keep going, don't let that hang you up. Hey, John. Hey there, Heather. Go ahead. I'll let you finish up. And then I want to talk about the next live stream that's going to be available for everyone. But uh, go ahead. Awesome. Yep. I just wanted to remind everybody, if you're feeling a little uh, hesitant about multiple choice on the Marco Learning YouTube page, we do have a video of John and I doing AP English Lit Multiple Choice. It's 20 minutes. So you may want to look that over if that's an area that you feel could use a little bit of extra work. But I just want to thank you guys for coming. I know that you're going to be fantastic. Get some rest, go into this test being confident and really just spend the time celebrating the hard work that you've put in all year because you have done so much to prepare for your AP exams. And this is really just a celebration of your awesomeness. Heather, I love your positivity. I think that's such great advice for everyone. And what I want you all to do in the chat right now is this is a very important line we've done at several of these Marco Learning streams, which is this. I, I, I want you all to type in, um, <clears throat> I will not be perfect, comma, and that is okay. Tomorrow, you will not be perfect, comma, and that is okay. Tomorrow, I will not be perfect, and that is okay, because tomorrow, how can you be perfect? You're just going to do the best work you can do. And I want to share my screen real quick and show you this incredible live stream. And in fact, Heather, if you could stop sharing your screen real quick, I'll do that. And then, um, and then what I'm going to do is show you all. So these two very incredible people, one who has tattoos, which is Tim Freitas on the right, and one who may have tattoos, nobody knows, is Gina Korchim on the left. They have a great resource available for you. We've put this in the chat. Um, and you know what, I'm going to pin this for you all to the top of the chat so that it's available to you. Um, so definitely check that out. This live stream starts in just a few minutes. So we're going to go ahead and end this live stream here in, in just a minute and then um, encourage you all to have a great day. If you've liked this video, press that like button. Heather, I so appreciate the wisdom that you've shared with students tonight. Um, by the way, I know that I'm like psychedelic yellow, <laughs> like this ambient lighting over here. Um, and I'm also in like a tunnel into the city of Philadelphia. So anyway, wherever you are today, best of luck to you tomorrow. Be in touch with us at Marco Learning. I see all the chat full of, I will not be perfect and that is okay. And that's the only way to do tomorrow. So Heather, thank you. Any other final words you wanted to say to AP students? Get some sleep tonight, guys, and you are going to be amazing tomorrow. I'm that's right. confident. <laughs> sleep and hydration and therapy and manifestations. So 